want art to do what it says it's supposed to do, which is be for anyone. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. It's another week of distressing news, with the coronavirus resurgent around the world, the economy tanking, increasingly hard-to-parse protests everywhere, and President Trump tweeting about postponing the election. So, we thought we'd try to lighten things up a bit (laughs) with a little bit of comfort food for the ears. The topic, art, artists, the people who want to be them, and how they can follow their dreams. And who better to talk to about this than Jerry Saltz, the Pulitzer Prize-winning art critic for New York Magazine, who I'm going to go out on a limb and say you've probably heard of before. He's been in movies, he's been a judge on a reality TV show, his social media following is off the charts, and now he has published his fifth book called How to Be an Artist. It evolved out of a 2018 New York Magazine article of the same name and contains 63 pieces of practical, inspiring, and empowering advice for people who, for whatever reason, wish they were the next Hilma of Clint, Kerry James Marshall, or, God forbid, Picasso. I had the pleasure of speaking to Jerry earlier this year for a live virtual conversation organized by New York's National Arts Club, which we recorded for this podcast. I hope you enjoy it. So we're going to jump into a freewheeling conversation here in the manner of these new Zoom things, starting with the book and moving on from there. How does that sound to you, Jerry? It sounds great, Andrew, and it's really good to see you uh, from where I am in Northwest Connecticut. I apologize to everybody for being a bit of a slow talker. We're about two hours north of New York. That's with my wife, Roberta Smith, who is the best art critic, in my opinion. Where are you, Andrew? I have no idea, really. Well, by some weird coincidence, I'm about uh, 20 miles away from you. (laughs) Well, we should all be Google Earth visiting each other. Like, give your address. I've been doing this and swooping on everybody's house and getting totally green-eyed monster jealous (laughs) in everyone's life. It is nice to be in the green at this moment. But before we get sidetracked, I I, I just want to talk about your book a little bit because it is really a great read. It's diverting, it's entertaining, it's filled with incredible quotes, and it dropped in March right around when the pandemic hit. So it's about how to be an artist. And a critical piece of information here is that you were actually an artist yourself before you became a critic. What kind of art did you make? Well, the embarrassing answer to that is not good enough to keep being an artist, or maybe it was good. I wrote a whole essay about it called My Life as a Failed Artist. And uh, in it, I talk about the 10 years that I spent making art. Now, I have no degrees, so I don't know what I'm talking about. And the same demons that live in your mouth live in my mouth. And they would say to me what yours said to you this morning, you don't know what you're doing. You're a fake. You're not educated enough. Who cares about what you're saying? You have a bad neck. You have no hair. You know, uh, it goes on and on. You don't have enough money. You don't know how to schmooze. And well, I... Uh, Behold somebody that's listened to the demons. This book, How to Be an Artist, is really a note to my younger self, Andrew. Mm. I'm 69 now, so I quit being an artist in my late 20s. Uh, I can't do math. Nobody in the art world can. That might be 40, 50, 30 years. But it's a note to my former self about what it takes to get through those long days and hard nights, dark nights. What I learned from every artist, from every writer like you, every work of art I've ever seen, and a lot of idiotic quotes that I've used as talismans to get through and keep working and have the one thing that I want everybody to have, which is 
a life lived in art. And that's what the book is for. It's not about how to make you a rich or famous artist. If you know how to do that, write the book. I could not write a book called How to Be a Critic because I don't have the slightest idea how you do that. None of us are doing what we do for the money. I want the bad, the good, the bad, and the very bad to make money. I never begrudge that, but as Andrew can tell you, uh, writing is not the way to make money. The writing is a way just to have a life in art. So that's what the book is, and I hope you know, you'll buy it and get to work, you big babies. <laughs> so you mentioned your uh, New York Magazine article that you called My Life as a Failed Artist, which was a terrific article. In fact, it was one of the articles that won you your Pulitzer. At the same time, it's not exactly the best resume line for somebody who's going to write a book on how to be an artist. No. Is there something about being a failed artist that gave you greater insight into what makes a successful artist? That's a great question. The one thing I think being any kind of artist gave me was a sense of the process itself, how much paint weighs, what it smells like, what it sounds like, how those hours of being alone, as opposed to the way you spend your hours as a writer or I do being alone. However, I would tell all people that go, and this applies to both me and Andrew, everybody. They say, how can you two write about art if you don't make it? I would say, excuse me, would you tell uh, people that have never made wine not to write about wine? Movie critics have never made a film. Baseball writers, Roger Angel is the Shakespeare at the New Yorker of baseball, and he's, he couldn't play a, an inning. So please chill. That is an ancient romantic uh, born only in the uh, early 19th century, idiotic, mostly male idea. So uh, wherever I started answering this, I don't know. But all I can tell everybody listening to this is I became an art critic by saying I was one after driving a truck for 10 years and being completely exiled by the end of this 10 years of driving to New York or to Florida uh, once a month, just miserable, as miserable as everybody gets doing the jobs that they don't want to do in the real world where it's very hard. And one day I just thought, I've got to get back in the art world. I really was thinking of it all the time. And I thought, well, I can't be a dealer because I have no money and I can't add. And I don't want to be a curator because I don't want to listen to artists say, put it over there. You know, I'm my own asshole. I don't need somebody to, you know, else to be one. Anyway, I went through all the jobs and I never wrote a word in my life. I could barely read. I graduated at the bottom of my very large high school class. And for some reason, I thought, eh, being a writer, that must be easy, which was pretty stupid. And in New York, one of the great things in any large city, when you tell somebody in a large city what you do, what do you do? And you go, mm, I'm, a, I'm an art critic. They'll go, cool. And you are an art critic. So then all you have to do is put your ass in the chair and sit down and get to work. And that took me another a bunch of years. So um, that's where I'm coming from. That's how I landed here. And somehow I'm still holding on. I have. I got to ask you because... You know, you've been a very illustrious critic for as long as many of your fans remember you. I don't think uh, you're, you're known primarily as an artist these days. But in the book, you talk about artists using the pronoun we. Do you still think of yourself as an artist? No. When you say the word and I ask myself if I am that, I'll be very honest with you this afternoon. I almost want to cry because it was a beautiful physical memory that will never leave my body. 
<laughs> I'm not an artist. I think of myself, how I frame myself to get through the days is never as a writer. I never think of that. An art critic is much too exotic for me. I think of myself as a kind of a folk critic or a Sister Wendy, if any of you are old enough to know who this English nun was that did art history classes for television, the BBC. Bob Ross was a favorite of mine. Of I want art to do what it says it's supposed to do, which is be for anyone. It's not for everyone, but it could be for anyone. We just don't know who that is. But anyway, uh, that's what I think of myself as that's how I power through every single day. So in, in your first big post-pandemic essay titled The Last Days of the Art World, you approvingly quoted the painter Peter Saul as saying, there are just too many artists, too many artists, period. Why do you think the world needs more artists? Why do you want to send this book out there and mint new artists all over the world? Uh, good, really a good and a very fair question. I think there can never be too many artists. I think that everyone is creative. Their creativity was with us in the caves. Their creativity is a survival mechanism, in fact, that Darwin himself, he never said it's survival of the fittest or the strongest a terrible misunderstanding that he spent the whole second part of his life trying to clear up. He said it's survival by those most able to adapt. And that is what is happening with art right now. Right now, art is exactly in those conditions that it's been made in for over 99% of its lifetime of the last, say, 75,000 years, which is under pressure in intimate settings. People are making things out of themselves with what's ever at hand. This is exactly how most things have been made. When the studio, the office, the bedroom, the kitchen, the playroom, the temple, all of it was one room. Our art world was beautiful, and I helped build that world in the 1980s and 90s with millions of other people, and all artists did. And then we all know that it answered every question with the same two answers. The two answers were always get bigger, get busier, and we did. And the art world got bloated. It lost its ability to adapt in some ways. It became like this big production. What, what I was quoting from Saul was more of the spirit of, come on, people, we've got to earn our way. Each one of us has to earn our way every day, including Andrew, including me. The night I got the Pulitzer, I thought, I probably will be able to keep my job for 11 more months. The demons don't go away. So yes, Andrew, I'm sorry. Uh, that Are there too many artists? No, there could be more. And I want my book to show that art has been more than what we made it in the last 20 years, which was always at 52 inches high in a white, clean room, always expensive, that art is not a noun, that it's a verb, it's magic. It seems that everything is, is now being questioned and obviously museums, galleries are closed all over America. They're starting to reopen in Europe and Asia. But I wanna ask you, as, as an art critic, what do you do when there are no shows that you can go and see and critique? My withdrawal symptoms of not seeing art in the flesh have been severe. Roberta and I used to see 20 or 30 shows a week. We have no other life like you, except you run a great, I would say right now, the best online art magazine. Thank you. That's what, and I know you have a whole auction side, but I've never figured out how the fuck to get into it, which is <laughs> fine. Anyway, 
Anyway, so I've chosen this time, Andrew, not to do the beautiful links of where you can go online to see art. And you've done many, many things these last months. But I begged my uh, editors at New York, don't use me for that. I want to take my work deeper. Now, that sounds pretentious. I know this, okay? And it's probably gotten shallower and stupider. But there are weird warblings in art that I've looked at my whole life, and I want to write about those. I wrote an essay on uh, Peter Bruegel's The Triumph of Death. I just finished another one on a Botticelli painting, an almost unknown. Mm -hmm. I wrote this essay called The Last Days of the Art World, but it wasn't apocalyptic because the second part of the title was, and this is what I want everyone to listen to me on, it said, and maybe the first days too. Because right now, you might be looking at my side of the screen, but really you're gonna end up looking at that side of the screen that I already built an art world and it was big and it was beautiful and it changed the world. It really did. But all of you are being tasked now to build a new world, to dispose in a way of what Andrew was just talking about. And it won't be an efficient art world. It'll be an eccentric art world. It won't be professional. Art has never not been here since the beginning, my loves. That means it's as necessary as economics, philosophy, religion, psychology, you know, we don't understand it. And it will only go away when every problem that was invented to solve has been solved. It is the most advanced operating system our species has ever developed to examine consciousness, the invisible world, the visible world, the dreamed world, to render the three-dimensional world in two dimensions. It's batshit uh, 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 adaptable, and then it'll disappear. So I miss seeing art in the flesh real bad, but I'm writing my ass off. I've never worked so hard. I want to make every second count. I'm writing as if I, who will probably never gain immunity to this disease because I can't bring it to my wife. I may never set foot in the real world again. So you talked about how art is infinitely adaptive and, uh, and the art world is always adapting to new scenarios. But it sounds like what, from what you're saying that you are, instead of kind of diving into this ooze of development and innovation, that you're instead looking back into history and looking back into yourself. Well, why, not, why not dive into the ooze? I do go to those online viewing rooms, but I, I think that art, like they say, is long and that we never understand it. I actually think that all art is contemporary art. To tell you the truth, if I wrote about cave paintings, Andrew, that's just, as contemporary as me writing about, you know, uh, a Henry Taylor new painting that he's working on and posting about. All art is contemporary because I see it now. You know, you talk about cave paintings and, you know, Botticelli, who are, they're all dealing with the reality of their time in this profound way. Have you noticed any art being made now in this strange new era of the coronavirus? that you think is addressing it in an interesting way, any kind of surprising or, or potentially lasting art that's being made now? There is no doubt that the content of this moment is being embedded in the work, every person's work alive. This is a very rare, completely shared molecule <laughs> that we're all living through. You might be painting flowers still, or painting stripes or triangles. But I promise you, my loves, the content of now will end up in your triangle. We almost owe it to the dead as the angel of death walks among us. 
All of that is in your work, everybody listening to this. So just stay safe. You mentioned um, the triangle, <laughs> which I probably maybe passed over a couple of people, but I, it's a quote from Art World Confidential, which is one of my favorite movies about the art world. And in your book, you have um, piece of advice number 41 is, quote, no, you don't need graduate school. So considering that art schools, which were already very expensive, are evolving into these remote teaching facilities and a lot of people are probably going to start seeing them as not being as critical as before, maybe not being really a valid, you know, use of money, especially when 25% of the population in the United States is predicted to, um, to become unemployed. What, what impact do you think the diminishing potential relevance of art schools is going to have on art? Boy, is that a pertinent question to now. We all know they became much too expensive. Tenure is bullshit. I say this as a geezer. So we know that schools have gotten way top heavy. However, I want all artists, on the other hand, to have the experience that comes from that, which is very simple. And we need schools for this reason. We're just going to have to rebuild them. Artists must, artists are vampires, man. They have to stay up late, just like Andrew does with his people when on his way up to this being the editor in chief of the best there is right now. You have to stay up late every single night with your goddamn peers, eating with them, drinking with them, sleeping with them, having the biggest fight of your life. And then the next morning swearing blood brothers and blood sisters. We know this. I want art schools to be like that, where you spend time together and make a new language. We have to have a more fluid teaching thing. And a lot of the teachers that have them are phenomenal. But come on, it's not 100%. And we got to change this. It's got to get cheaper. And I do want it in person for you when you uh, do go back to school. And you kids, you will go back to school. You already know this, and it will be fucking fantastic. So, so this environment that you talk about with people hanging out, staying up late, you know, talking to each other, that sounds a lot like uh, the New York art scene. You know, that it's, it's a little bit like a, a free art school in a way because it, there's so much compacted frisson of creativity and excitement around it that this, this whole virus is obviously um, terrible for the New York art scene because it, it's going to a lot of businesses, it's going to make livelihoods impossible or much harder. But are, are there any ways in which you think it might be good for the New York art scene? New York's greatest gift has always been one thing and one thing only, which is its density. That I could go out, Andrew, and run into you without having to call you to ask you to meet me. And I'm too shy to do that. So when I used to meet you in the galleries, I'd be like, oh, hello, how are you? Good to see you. Oh, I got to go. But inside, I was like, I'm so excited. I got to talk to him. And we compared dumb ideas. And then he went that way and I went this way. And that was great. New York is now at a disadvantage for the first time. As Andrew mentioned, many other countries are going to open up because they have leaders and tracking programs and testing. America, we know, is a failed state. Uh, and it's only becoming more of what it already was. However, in Los Angeles or wherever you are, I, you're not taking an elevator and the subway to get to the crowded gallery. Yes, we're lucky in New York. We're all full all the time. But suddenly all these other places are at an advantage. So what I would tell everybody listening to this, Open up shitty spaces. If you build it, they will come. I promise you. This is a new art world. Yes, maybe there'll be too much reporting again on the same people because they're great. 
I love them. I helped build all of that bad, wonderful, tremendous, tremendous world. But if you build it, they will come. Well, I think I, that's a profound place to end. Um, thank you very much, Jerry. Thank you, Andrew, for your great work. And thank you, National Arts Club. It takes a pretty goddamn big village. And that's what we all are together. And uh, I miss you all more than you can know. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Tim Schneider and Caroline Goldstein and edited by Nick Long. Thanks for listening and see you next week. Thank you.